tupigia watu makofi as we take our seats. We can have our seats. It is such an honor to be here today. I am so glad to be uh, the speaker of today. My name is Wageshi. Wamwaneki, I'm born again. I love the Lord. Uh, it is the greatest honor of my life to be standing here today. I am a daughter of this house. My family and I started coming to this church when I was six years old. I was in class two. So I've gone through Sunday school here. I've danced Upit, a Gideonite. I have served as an Axis and now Nangalia YP Ita. My days in Axis are over and I'm looking at the young professionals. And it's such an honor to be serving in this place as a young person. I am so, so blessed to be here. Thank you so much, Bishop and Mom, for allowing us young people to have a space in this place and to serve God. Thank you so, so much. The pastoral team, thank you for this opportunity. I don't take it for granted. I don't take it lightly. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to get into the word of God today, but before I do, I have uh, my family around, and I know I can see my parents up there, Mr. and Mrs. Moneki. Would I ask them to stand so that we see them? They are my parents. Can you clap for <laughs> Those are my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Moneki. I honor you so much, mom and dad. I love you deeply. I tell you often, but today I'm here to also say that I love you so deeply and I honor you so thoroughly. I don't know if there is any other person who is my blood now around. You know, if you're my blood and you're around. I know my best friend is somewhere. I want to quickly ask her to stand. I don't know where she is. There she is. That's my best friend. Thank you for being here. God bless you for being here today. So this week we have been having the Harvest Conference, and our theme has been The Return, The Return. Today, my theme, or the title that I have, is Return from Idolatry, Dwell in the Worship of God. That is my theme. If you're writing, Return from Idolatry, Dwell in the Worship of God. It is one thing to return, as we have been returning the whole week. It is another thing to remain after you have returned. And so we have two key texts that I'm going to uh, be reading from the NKJV. We have Jeremiah chapter 2 from verse 1 to 13. We're going to read that. And then we're going to read Exodus 32 from verse 1 to 14. Let's start with Jeremiah chapter 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. Neither did they say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts, a pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt. I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness, but when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the Lord did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Verse 9, therefore I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children I will bring charges. For pass beyond the coasts of Cyprus and sea, send to Kedah and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, by my people have changed their glory for what does not Prophet, verse 12, be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. We run quickly to Exodus chapter 32 from verse 1 to 14, which is our main text. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming 
time, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come make us gods that shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast day feast day to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up early to play. And the Lord said to Moses, go get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people and it, indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. Verse 11, then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out of um, Egypt to harm them, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and say to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of, I give to your descendants and they shall inherit in forever. Verse 14, so the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Let us bow our heads and thank God for his word. Oh Lord, we are so grateful that you've gathered us in your presence today. As we divide the word of truth, dear Lord, how we pray that our hearts will be fertile ground, that God, you'd allow us to be changed by this ever beautiful word, O oh God. May you cause our lives to ever be transformed. As you keep sanctifying us to look like Jesus through your word, O oh God, we pray that God, our lives would never be the same again. We honor you and we love you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and believing. Amen. Now, my topic is return from idolatry, dwell in the worship. The term return implies that someone or somebody has been at a specific place and now were moved and now they're trying to get back. Idolatry, the best uh, definition in here is that it's the worship of someone or something other than God as though it were God. When we attach to the created, that is people, things, and places, our loyalty, our undying devotion, our adoration, and extreme confidence in a way that is meant only for God, the creator, we commit idolatry. And it is easy for people to say, well, the people that committed idolatry were those people who are back in the day, you know, they made things and they worshipped those things. But look down deep inside you and ask yourself, what is the thing that I have placed before God? Is it my children? Is it my family? Is it money? Is it possession? Is it a title deed somewhere? Is it, what is it that you have placed before God by your deeds, by your thoughts, by your actions, by your priorities? And that is an idol. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first thing we learn about God is not about his mercy, is not about his forgiveness, is not about his love. The first thing we get to know about God through the scripture is that he is creator. It says, in the beginning, God created. If God is the creator and I am the created, it means he's sovereign over me. He has authority over me. It means he comes first, I come second. I serve not him serving me because in the beginning God say with me in the beginning God in the beginning God created. And so he is the creator and I am the created. And if he's not first, 
as creator, then it means I have raised up an idol in my life. When humans place anything, a person, material possession before God, that is an idol. Tim Keller says in his book, Counterfeit Gods, he says, an idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart, your imagination more than God, and anything that you seek to give you what only God can give you. It is easy to think, well, I have not committed idolatry, but closely examine your life. Where does your time go to? Where does your energy go to? Where do you get, where do you throw all your resources? Where does your love and your admiration go to? Where do you get your joy from? If you don't get your joy fast from the Lord, oh, I'm here to tell you that you have an idol. What brings me joy? What do I prioritize? Where have I placed my identity? Are you able to introduce yourself and not say what you do for a living? Are you able to introduce yourself and not tell us where you start? Are you able to introduce yourself and not mention how many children you have? If you can't and you've placed identity first in anything that is not God, you have an idol. And I'm here to tell you that sometimes idols are not bad things. They are actually gifts from God. They are things that we asked God for, but we have taken them and replaced them and now we are bowing to those things first and not God. You tell God, oh God, give me children. And then when, when God gives you children, he has given you with children, you have placed your children before God. You hear people say things like, you know me, I can do anything for my kids. I can kill for my children. It sounds nice, eh? It sounds nice for when your mom says she can kill for you. Cindy, in a sound, eh, I have a backing, eh? I can kill for my spouse. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have watched in the news when people have conflict in marriages that killed one another. And you ask yourself, where do I draw my affirmation from first? If it is in a human being, if it's in a material thing, then I have an idol. And if God is not first on my list, I am in danger. I have an idol. Modern day idols look like money, careers, hobbies, relationships, children, fame, celebrities, phones. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If we're going to do this right, you have to say amen rightly. Hallelujah. There we go. Our phones. I got the opportunity to go to the encounter last weekend. Praise God. And when we go to the encounter, one of the first things they take is your phone. And you ask yourself, Siku tatu. Tatu. Sijangalia WhatsApp. Sijangalia Instagram. Sijangalia. And you, you wonder, what have these phones become? What have they become? What have they become? What have they become? You get your phone, you get home, and you ask God, God, give me a family. The Lord is so gracious. He gave you a family. But in the sitting room, we are all like this. To Kwaapa. What have these things become? These things are essentially not bad things, but our absolute devotion to them before God and before his kingdom causes them to be dangerous. It causes them to be idols. And you know what idols are? They are sin. Ooh, somebody say amen. No idols are. They are sin because they take us away from our faith love what we read in Jeremiah they take us away from God they take our devotion and our admiration and our joy from God the creator into the created things now we just read Exodus chapter 32 verse 1 to 14 and the history is this the Lord has saved Israel from Egypt we see this in Exodus 13 he himself leads them into the wilderness. Exodus 13 from 17 to 18. And they get into the wilderness and they are so excited. In Exodus 15, they even, they, what young people would call a the dicks. Hallelujah. Are there, are there any young people? This has been young people week. Young people, praise God. The dicks. When I was in high school, not many years ago, just a few years ago, you would write a mail, a letter to your beloved. Yeah? Unamwambia mambo ya kukata na shoka, mambo ya ajabu na kweli, mambo ya kina, eh, mambo ya zito. And then when you finish the letter, 
unampea kadikesho tawimbo unamwambia i'm dedicating this song to you the dicks that's what a dicks is okay and so the children of israel after god has saved them they are so excited about god exodus 15 is a dedics from israel to god they tell god oh you ha- you are my salvation you that has saved us from egypt you that has saved us from destruction you are my salvation these are the children of god saying you are the one who saved us out of Egypt. That is important to note because after they have raised an idol, we hear them say Moses, this man that brought us out of Egypt, they have become foolish in their idolatry. That now they don't even remember who brought them out of Egypt. In Exodus 15, they're, they're, they're telling God, you are my salvation. You are the Lord on whom I am, I am from. When we sing the song Buana Ningome Yangu Amekua that is the dedics we have in Exodus 15. But because of the idols they have raised, we'll see in just a minute, they have become foolish. Now, when they have come from um, singing about God, they have also seen the miracles of God. In Exodus 15, they are hungry and God manna from heaven. Then we see God provide water from a rock. We see all these miracles take place. And then in Exodus 19, something beautiful happens. The Lord says, okay, so now I have saved you. I'm coming to meet with you. And the Lord tells Moses, prepare the people, consecrate the people. I'm coming to meet with the people. And so they are prepared. They wash themselves. They clean themselves for three days. And then the Lord visits them in Exodus 19. And something beautiful happens. The mountain, because they've just camped at Mount Sinai, and the mountain is filled with smoke. And there is thunder, and there is a huge voice, and there is a sound of a trumpet, and the people are filled with fear. And in Exodus 20, after the Lord has given the Ten Commandments, this is what the people tell Moses. I want us to read Exodus 20, 18 to 21. Then it... Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. 21 and 22. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. Verse 23. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. Verse 24. An altar of the earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name will come to you and I will bless you. After they have met with the Lord, this is what God says. I have come to test you that you may know that I am God. He's come in awesome wonder with thunder and lightning and a whole trumpet sound. And the Lord warns them against idolatry. And then we find ourselves in chapter 32. So Moses has gone up to the mountain to meet with God. And he stays there for a while. And it's so interesting because before you get to verse 32, the Lord is laying out the law. He's telling them, this is what I want you to do. He's laying out what we'd call the Torah, in other words. He's laying out the law. He's laying out the, 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 how they ought to behave religiously. How they ought to behave with one another, masters with servants. And then in verse 32, it's like we take a detour. Because God is the one who brings to attention to Moses what is happening down there. And verse 32, verse 1, Exodus 32, verse 1 says, Now when the people saw that Moses had delayed coming from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I want us to learn three things from Exodus 32 from verse 1 to 14 and we'll be done. The first thing that we're going to be looking at is how do we fall into idolatry? 
Number two, we're going to be looking at what are the consequences of idolatry. Number one, how do we fall into idolatry? Number two, what are the consequences of idolatry? Number three, how do we return and remain in the worship of God? We're going to start with how do we fall into idolatry. Two verse one says, we've just read it, but we're going to read it one more time. Exodus 32 verse one, it says that now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming from the mountain, A, we fall into idolatry when we are impatient with God. We fall into idolatry when we are impatient with God. When we are so tired of waiting on God, we want to form our own means. And believer, in Christianity, the end does not justify the means. Both the end and the means are important. You can't say, Bora, I have gotten what I have gotten. No, both the end and the means are important to a believer. And so I need to remain patient as I wait for God. Jackie Hill Perry says that faith is intertwined with patience. This is to say, my patience is a direct indication of my faith in God. How much faith do you have in God? Are you willing to wait on him? Or do you want to form for yourself a cistern that cannot even hold water? Are you willing to wait on God? The people was, they, they figured that because Moses has delayed, let us make our own God that will go before us. But who had delivered them out of Egypt? Who had provided manna in the wilderness? Who had provided water from a rock? When they grew impatient, they set up an idol for themselves. Number two, we fall into idolatry when we forget who God is and what he has done. We fall into idolatry when we forget who God is and what he has done. In high school, we sang hymns a lot, and one of my favorite for th from them is count your blessings one by one, and it will surprise you how much or what the Lord has done. Are you so alert to remind yourself of who God is and what he has done? It says in 32 that they wanted a God to go before them. They were so intoxicated with the idea of Canaan, they forgot who it was that started the journey with them. Who was it that came to them and told them, I'll save you from Egypt? It was God's idea. It wasn't the idea to save themselves. It was God's idea. God's idea to save them, then who would sustain them? God. When you forget who God is and you forget what he has done, believer, you will start to set for yourself idols. Am I so excited about the destination? I don't mat it doesn't matter how I get there. You hear people say, I have to get rich. Yani hustle hard, get the cash. Do whatever you need to do to get the mula. But believer, you can't do whatever you need to do to get the money. No, you can't. You can't because when you do, it means you have forgotten who God is and what he can do. Who saved you when you were dying in sin? Did you save yourself? Did you save yourself? Who provided the days you were hungry? You want to tell me it's money? When God provided visitors from nowhere to feed you in your hunger, did you give yourself food to eat or was God who provided the school fees? You want to tell us, oh, you know, my education saved me. But what were you doing before the degree when Jesus saved you? When we forget who God is and what the Lord has done. Number three, we fall into idolatry when we fear the unknown. Exodus 32 verse 1 says that this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Now the Lord holds the privilege of knowing it all while I don't, because he is God and I am not. John Carson says that God I can fully comprehend is not God at all. Then why would I, then why would there need to be a God if I can comprehend everything and I know everything? What is the need of God? 
Believer, what is the need of God? I need to be able to accept that the Lord knows it all and I don't know it. That he has the big picture and I don't have it. And so my work is to remain next to God. When he says move to the right, I move to the right. When he says move to the left, I move to the left because I do not have the whole big picture. But the Lord, oh blessed be God, he has the picture. He knows it all. He knows my beginning to my end. He knows from when I was born to when will die. He knows it all. Amen. Woo! Amen? Amen. We, when we, we fall into idolatry, number four, when we take the gifts of God to be more valuable than God himself. When we take the gifts of God to be more valuable than God himself. We're going to read Exodus chapter 12 from verse... No, we're going to read 11 from verse 1 to 3. Exodus 11 from verse 1 to 3. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Verse 2. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. Verse 3. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. When the people have gathered in Exodus 32 and they have given um, Aaron their golden earrings, one of the things I ask myself is where did they get these things because they had been slept for years and years and years. And when you read Exodus 11 and Exodus 12 from 35 to 36, you will discover that it was God's idea for them to leave Egypt with great material possession. So it was God's idea to bless them with the gold, to bless them with the articles of silver. It was God's idea for them to leave Egypt rich with gold. But when God has delayed, when Moses had mountain, what do they do? They take the gifts of God, they carve out a calf, and they bow down to it. Believer, the things that you ask God for are now the hindrance between, between you and God. They are the hindrance in your relationship. They are the hindrance in you serving God and serving the people of God. You were so zealous before the gifts came. Oh, but the cat came and now you can't go to church because surely Akunanga parking this year, KZ. You know, you you are so you you gave yourself to God before you got a spouse. Hallelujah. Blessed be God for the young people. Blessed be God for the young people. Blessed be God for the young people. And then the spouse has come. No, not just as a Susie can say, Zenda Kanisa Lafu Nitam Tamwacha Jequanumba and Alasman in Piki breakfast. Praise Jesus. Oh, the children have come. Imagine whom to talk and Isumbu and Kingia service. Imagine this AKZ to Kona Mother's Room. Amen. To Kona Mother's Room. You can come with your child to see me at a Kua hindrance. When we take the gifts of God to be more valuable than God, God is better than any money I will ever get. I'm not saying that I will not be rich. Oh, watch out, I shall be rich. But He is. Better than any possession I will get. He's better than any car I will drive. He's better than the spouse I will have. He's better than the children I will have. He's more valuable to me than anything I will have in this world. And when I set him to be better than anything I will get, I will not fall into idolatry. We fall into idolatry when we turn our eyes from God and into the culture or the environment we live in. I have a picture from the media team. I don't know if they can get it for us. When we turn our eyes from God and into the culture, as they are putting that. Now, this is an image of a god of Egypt known as Apis. He is the god of fertility. Uh, next picture. And this is what historians would say the calf that the Egyptians, that the Israelites molded in Exodus 32. Can you go back, back a bit? I want you to compare and contrast. Where did they get the idea of molding a calf? Why didn't they make a donkey or an eagle or anything? They made a calf. 
Can you see relationship? Can you see the similarity? When we take our eyes from God and into the culture, oh, we will fall into idolatry. I want to speak to us because many times when things are not working out and we are so tired on waiting on God, we, we, we tend to look at what is happening in the culture. What do, what do young people do to make it or break it? We want to look at the culture. We've turned our eyes from God and we are looking at the culture. We are looking at what do people do in the world to get money? What do they do? What do people in the world do to get spouses when they feel like God has delayed? You know, what do people in the world do to get children when they feel like God has delayed? When we turn our eyes from God and look into the culture, we will fall into idolatry. And then Paul will tell us in Romans chapter 12 that do not conform into the patterns of the world, but rather let your mind be renewed. Come on somebody, let your mind be renewed. Let your mind be renewed. Can you be busy learning about God through the Bible so that your eyes are not so busy looking at the culture? What do young people do to have fun? What do young people do to feel a joy inside of themselves? Oh, when you look into culture, you will fall into idolatry. I want us very quickly to go into the consequences of idolatry the consequences of idolatry. Number one, and I mentioned this earlier, it causes us to be foolish and blind. We cannot tell what is good from bad. We cannot tell what is right from wrong. We are so blinded, we can't even tell what is and what is not. You have the people in Exodus 32 verse 4 saying that this God they have just murdered is the one that saved, saved them from Egypt. But was this... This God that they've just molded, was it present when they were coming from Egypt? Believer, was it present when they were coming from Egypt? But they've become so foolish and so blinded, they actually think that this God that they have just made brought them out of Egypt. Believer, your money did not get you out of poverty. The Lord did. Believer, your money did not save your family. The Lord did. Believer, your education did not set you before kings, the Lord did. Believe your knowledge and wisdom did not set you before the kingdoms, the Lord did. Do not be so blinded to think that the material things you have acquired are the things that are setting you on that table that you sit. The Lord did. And if the Lord did, then all my devotion, all my admiration, all my praise, all, every bit of me is unto God. Two, the consequences of idolatry. Idolatry leads us into other sins. Exodus verse chapter 32 verse 6, it says that after they had set up this idol... Exodus chapter 32 verse 6, then they rose up early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The word there, rose up to play, is being light. The writer is being light. Rose up to play means they rose up, they got drunk, they committed sexual immorality in front of this altar that they had created, and they parted the whole night away doing things that are so shameful that the writer says rose up to play. Because if they were written there, it would be scandalous. The idols that we raise in our lives sets us into other sins. Believer, ask yourself, why is it that this country, every now and then we keep crying corrupt, oh, corruption, because of the idols that we have set. We set money to be an idol, and so by whatever means possible, we find ourselves in corruption. And if you disobey God, on the first four commands, in Exodus 20, we have the Ten Commandments. And the first four relate to our worship with... If you disobey the first four commandments, the other that relate to us will not be so hard. If you can raise up an idol to go before you instead of God, you can steal. Yes. If you raise up an idol, if you dishonor God with the first bits of the first commandment, the others that relate to human beings, me and you, they'll not be so hard. They won't be so hard. You will be corrupt. And it will be... Amen? Because when we start with idolatry, 
we fall into all other types of sins. We're looking at the consequences of idolatry. Number three, the Lord denies us. Exodus 32 verse 6 to 7. The Lord, when he's addressing Moses, he tells them that, he tells Moses, these people that you brought out of Egypt. Remember in Exodus 15, the people are saying that God is the one who brought us out of Egypt. But the Lord is so angry, he denies them. He denies them. He says, Moses, these are your people. It's God saying, si watu wangu. Si mimi niliwasave. <laughs> Ni watu wako wendo uliwatoa. And believer, it is a dangerous and scary thing for the Lord to deny you. Oh, I would rather be denied by men, but not God. Oh, I would rather be denied by the multitudes, but not God. It is a scary thing when the Lord denies you. Number four, the Lord abandons us. When we fall into idolatry, the Lord abandons, ab eh, abandons us. I want to read a chapter in the Bible that scares me. That scares me thoroughly. Romans chapter 1 verse 21 to NKGV. Romans chapter 1 verse 21 to 32. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the last of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the created who is blessed forever. Amen. For the reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for words. Go back a bit. For even women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Continue. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up. He gave them over to a debased mind to do these things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. The last verse 32. who knowing the righteousness, the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. If there is a chapter in the Bible that scares me, it's Romans chapter 1. Because this is what God is saying essentially. Because you have decided to not follow me, I will give you up into your sin. And the Lord allows you to continue to do what you're doing, not because he's being merciful, but because he's tired. He's saying, do whatever you do. It's okay, do it. And it scares me because when I look at the generation we are living, and I look at the Western world that is slowly coming into Africa with things like rights, it scares me because I ask myself, is that the Lord giving us? Is that the Lord saying, do whatever you do? When the Lord abandons you, abandons you to do whatever you want to do, believer, it is a scary thing. It is a scary thing. When we have things like rights infiltrating the church, it is a scary thing. When we have people saying, you know, I can do whatever I want because there is grace. Oh my goodness, it is a scary thing. It is a scary thing because it means, is the Lord saying to ourselves? Is he saying, do whatever you want to do? And because we have raised up idols in our hearts, 
the Lord is abandoning. And it's a scary thing. One of the, con the other consequences is we invite the wrath of God on our lives. Exodus 32 from verse 9 to 10 is talking about how God was so mad. He's saying that I have seen the people and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Verse 10. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. This is a very interesting part of this story because God is giving Moses a deal. He's saying, I'll wipe these people out and I will start a nation with you. And you see, technically, God would have still fulfilled the promises he made to Abraham because Moses is still part of the lineage, right? So he's saying, I will destroy those people and start a new nation with you. And believer, there are many plans and great purposes that you risk losing that the Lord has for you because of the idols that you've set up in your heart. The Lord is going to use anyone who is devoted to him rather than use someone who has raised up an idol in their life. The Lord was willing to use a stammerer to fulfill his promises and be done with Israel because of their sin. And so because the Lord is merciful and he has not left us to ourselves, we're going to tackle the last thing and I'll be done. How to return and remain from idolatry. How to return and remain from idolatry. Exodus chapter 32 verse 31 and 32. Chapter 32. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your block, which you have written. Before we get here, the first thing that Moses does is he intercedes for the people. I want you to write that down, intercedes for the people. He goes to God and he's re repenting for the people. He's telling God, don't let the Egyptians laugh and say that you brought them out of, of Egypt to come and destroy them in the wilderness. I want to encourage the leaders in this place, the young leaders in this place, the older leaders in this place. There is a place for interceding for the people of God because that is what Moses does. He tells God, do not allow the Egyptians to laugh and say that you saved them out of Egypt to come and destroy them in their will. There are two types of intercession, and that is the first point. The first point is repent, intercede for yourself, intercede for your brother. Repent, intercede for yourself, intercede for your brother. Repent, intercede for yourself intercede for your brother. When you feel that there are things that are taking first position other than God, you repent and you intercede for yourself. You tell God, oh God, would you help me to put you first? Would you help me that all my admiration is for you first? And then intercede for your brother. Because it is not beautiful in the body of Christ when a brother is falling, when a brother has set up an idol in their heart. If one part of the body is ailing, Paul would say, then the whole body is ailing and so even in the body of Christ when part one part of the body is ailing because of setting up idols in their life then the whole body is, re is ailing we have a place we have an assignment to intercede for ourselves and to intercede for our brothers the second is an atonement for our sin accept the atonement for your sin accept the atonement for your sin the wages of sin is death. And in story, that day, Moses tells the people, if you are for God, stand on this side. If you are not for God, stand on the other side. And on that day, about 3,000 men died. And the people remained. Moses says this from Exodus 32, 30 to, 30, to 32. He says, let me go to the Lord and make an atonement for you. If the wages of sin is death, and because we have all sinned and turned away from God, we deserve to die. These people, the people of Israel, their atonement was a lamb that had no spot. But you and I are living in a better covenant because our atonement is Jesus Christ. The children of Israel went ahead to fall into idolatry again and again and again. 
countless times. In the place of being human and their heart being so hardened, they chose other people and gods over their Lord. The bloods of unspotted lambs could not maintain their salvation from sin. The atonement through the lambs failed. It could only speak for them temporarily. It could only serve them to some point. It had not the ability to change their hardened hearts. It didn't have the ability to maintain their salvation. But you and I are in a better place. You and I, the people of God, are what God told Jeremiah, that he would make their hearts to be of life of stone. You and I have been atoned for greatly through the blood of Jesus. Would you accept the atonement of sin and look to Jesus? Because if Jesus saved you, he's able to sustain you. If Jesus saved you, he's able to keep you. If Jesus saved you, he will keep you today, tomorrow and up to the end. Romans 5 as we finish from verse 6 to 11 in the King James Version, please. Romans chapter 5, 6 to 11 in the King James Version. For when, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Verse 8. But God commanded his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Believer, we are in a better covenant because we have been atoned for by Jesus, who is the perfect lamb and the great high priest, who is our reward and our treasure. He is a better deal. You and I are in a better covenant because the Lord is changing our hearts to be that of flesh so that we are not hardened to, to say no to God, but we are accepting of God and accepting of the things of God. Oh, believer, you are in a better covenant because the one who saved you is able to sustain you, is able to keep you up to the very end. I'm going to end with one of my favorite portions of scripture, Jude uh, verse 24 and 25. Jude verse 24 and 25. It says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. The good news is that the Lord is able to keep you, believer. He's able to keep you inside of him. He's able to keep you from idolatry. He's able to keep you. He's able to keep your heart to be, to be for him. He's able to keep you, not just now, but tomorrow and forever. I want you to stand up and I want you to look at your life as we finish this sermon and the places and the things that you have set above God. I want you to be in a moment of prayer and I want you to repent before the Lord and to tell him to forgive you for the things that you have set up before him. It could be a career, it could be education, it could be a person, it could be children. What are the things that you have set before God, what are the things that you have idolized? I want you to repent before the Lord and I want you to ask him to help you to accept his atonement that he would keep you because he's able to keep you today, tomorrow and forever. Would you go before the Lord in prayer? If you're able to speak in tongues, would you speak in tongues before the Lord? Oh dear master, we ask for your forgiveness for the things that we have set before you, oh God. We lay down our crowns, dear master. We lay down the idols that we have placed before you, oh God, that you would have mercy on us, dear Master, that you would forgive us, dear Lord, through the powerful blood of Jesus. We ask that, dear Lord, you'd allow us our devotion to be to you, our admiration is to you, our joy is to you, oh God, our faithfulness is to you, our loyalty is to you, dear Master. Every bit of ourselves is to you. Oh, come on, believer, do not be quiet in this moment would you go before the Lord would you go before the Lord and speak to him this morning would you go before the Lord and set down those
those idols and set down those things that have taken the first position instead of God? Would you go before and cry out to him that he would be first in your life? Oh, dear master, we set aside the idols and the things that we have set before you, oh God. Would you take the first place in our hearts? God and our Father, we are so grateful this morning. We thank you because you are our God and we are your people. Lord, we set down every idol, every crown, everything that we may have held so dear that is taking first position instead of you, oh God. We set them aside this morning, dear Master, that you would be God of our lives, that you would be our God and us, your people. We desire to live in your house forever. We desire to be moved by the things of God. We desire to be moved by your things, dear Master. We refuse to be tied down to the materials that we have we refuse to replace you with the gifts that you have given us we refuse to replace you with any idol, with any person with any material thing we refuse to replace you with anything dear Lord because you are far much more greater to us than anything oh God you are far much more greater than gold you are far much more greater than silver you are far much more greater than wealth you are far much more greater than houses and money you are far much more greater oh God and we yield ourselves to you dear master that we would live in light of the atonement for our sin that is Christ Jesus. We desire to live in light of the atonement for our sin. We desire to live in light of eternity. We desire to live in light of the day that you're coming back for our victorious church. We desire to live in light of you, oh God. We desire to live in light of you, oh God. Would you help us, dear master? Would you cause us to be like you, dear master? We desire to be conformed into the image of Christ Jesus. We desire to be like you, oh Oh God, we refuse to be like the world because we are not of this world. We are a royal priesthood, oh God. We are citizens of heaven. And so, Lord, we give ourselves up to you that we may live the way you want us to live. That we may prioritize that which you want us to prioritize. That you'd be our God and would be your people. We honor you, oh God. We love you today, dear Master, and we surrender every bit of ourselves to you. Receive our praise, receive our adoration, for it's in Jesus' name we have prayed, believing, and trusting.